Oh yeah, so, so in materials and methods, so four, we're getting into the commercial aspects. So in today's lecture, we're actually going to be covering a fair few things. So this is this is in regards to, to glazing. So I put up the video uh, from from when we had the guest lecturer from Chevron come in, and so that that video is there for a lot of information about about glazing, and that's a really good video to see. Uh, but this this is another um, presentation in regards to the, the curtain wall glazing, typically for um, for multi-storey commercial projects, and this is going to be applicable for task three. Also, what we'll be covering tonight is uh, just briefly plasterboard and internal linings. So we'll go through that, um, but that's uh, th that doesn't have to be included in task three. And then finally, if we've got enough time tonight, we'll get into the the whole calculation for for um, energy assessment for the building. Now this is not an energy assessment as it relates to energy assessment for compliance. That's just energy um, assessment for deciding on services and application of services. So looking at the commercial, um, how do I say the 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 efficiencies and the, the economics in regard to the provision of services. So that's a very important. Uh, part for task three. So um, there is also there's also additional information in regards to glazing on on the on the learn site. So I, I encourage you to to have a look at at all of that. And then there's also another um, apart from this one, another PowerPoint presentation on glazing on the learn site for you to go through yourself at home. So glazing of commercial buildings comes in many forms and styles. Some terms associated with glazing are frameless. So that's where we uh, don't have, or essentially we don't don't have the have the frames, but you can you can have other structural glass elements, so glass fins and things like that, to produce large um, expanses of glass that that aren't interrupted by frames. Storefront. That's typically. The, the glazing that you'll see, and that's the glazing that we have here in the in the tape here. This is this is uh, where you've got aluminium frames, aluminium mullions um, separating, so smaller panes of glass, typically at a, you know at a street level or so in in areas where where you've got uh, pedestrians. Curtain wall glazing, curtain wall glazing is where you wrap a building or or just one facade of the building in a curtain of glazing. So that, that curtain of glazing sits on the outside of the building and that has been covered a bit, um, description of that has been covered in that, that Chevron guest lecture class. So that um, typical, or well, some notable curtain wall glazing buildings in Adelaide, well there's, there's a lot of curtain wall glazing in the city. Probably the most notable is the SA Water building on uh, Victoria Square. You, you know the one, Tommy? Yep. Yep. So, yeah, some fairly, um, how do I say, some fairly impressive curtain wall glazing there. But there's there's plenty of plenty of um, yeah instances of curtain wall glazing around the city. Uh, got uh, glass is used for partitions, so it's not just as an external element in buildings, but you also have have glazed partitions within buildings and and within within offices. Um, in term in terms of slump, so slump, uh, that's, that's talking about the the manufacture of of glass. Toughened glass, that's that's a type of so so typically, all your glass starts out as float glass. So that's glass which is manufactured on a bed of molten metal, which gives it that really smooth, incredibly flat um, finish. And can I say it? Um, uh, uh, that that reliable reliable thickness and smoothness, but then to create toughened glass glass that float glass is then heated up once again and then cooled at a at a very specific rate to create uh, a structure within that glass to um, that gives that glass additional strength to to uh, resist impact, but then when it does break under severe impact, it breaks into tiny little shards. So uh, if, if, if any of you have broken a window at home that's just the, the float glass, you get very large pointed shards 
of glass, but if you break a windscreen or so of your car, which is toughened glass, that breaks into these tiny little little beads. Yeah, exactly, safety glass. Yeah, although there 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 are many different types of safety glass. You've got laminated safety glass as well, which may be in the windscreen of your, of your car. If you break the windscreen, the, the windscreen stays stays intact. Um, so you, your toughened glass breaks into small pieces, but sometimes you've got several layers of toughened glass excuse me, laminated on each other with a, with a polythene film between them, and that is um, laminated safety glass. So that glass won't won't break, or you won't be able to bust through that glass because of that polythene film on the inside. Also, those polythene films can be tinted, and they can also um, have uh, have various different uh, properties that help the em emissivity of that glass or for, for um, the solar heat gain coefficient and, and reflection. There are some types of glass which are self-cleaning as well. So those self-cleaning, uh, that self-cleaning glass uses nanotechnology basically to create a polarisation on that glass surface which repels dust particles. So when you get um, dirt and dust, etc., settling on that glass, the the nanotechnology makes that makes that uh, those small particles want to fall off the glass. So essentially, it's it's um, yeah, it's a glass that keeps itself clean. Also, in another common term in in well, typically in in curtain wall glazing, is where you've got the curtain wall glazing that extends past the floors because the curtain wall glazing extends from our ground floor or from ground in some situations all the way up and it extends past several different floors as it, as it goes up. Where you have those floors, in some situations it's important to, to block off the visibility of that, that concrete slab where it, meets, where it meets the glazing because it's not a particularly attractive architectural detail. When you have those, those situations, those pieces that you put in front of that um, slab are called the spandrel. So that's when you want to be hiding hiding elements like concrete slabs or hiding elements like services and, and so on. So some curtain wall glazing, like what you have in the SA water building, is just glass from one from from uh, top to bottom, whereas other curtain wall glazing situations use these spandrel panels intermixed with glazing in between them. So as, as we can see here on this curtain wall glazing uh, set up here, we've got our curtain wall glazing, and then we've got our spandrel panels in between those. So that's our, so our green sections of the spandrel panels. So curtain wall, a non-load bearing exterior glazing system used to create the exterior skin of a building. This is our storefront aluminium glass framing. Um, so yeah, typically used in ground floor locations of commercial buildings. So much much like what we have have here in at the in at the TAFE. And yeah, and that should be a system that, that most are fairly familiar with. Uh, it's also a lot of a lot of these um, frames are thicker. Like when we when we're doing commercial glazing, you use thicker frames than you would within residential glazing. However, the incorporation of these you know these 50 millimeter frames is um, is also becoming fairly common in, in residential architecture as well, where we incorporate those those thicker frames. So curtain wall, it's uh, uh, multi-span, so you get very large spans of, of glazed element. It has to resist much higher design pressures. So the design pressures that are on that, that curtain wall glazing are typically wind loadings, not only, um, not only wind pressure on the glass to push it in, but um, suction on that glass as wind pours past uh, glazed elements, it can it creates it can create a lot of suction, particularly when you're when you're dealing with high-rise buildings and uh, and these multi-storey buildings, in concert with other multi-storey buildings in the city, you get some how do I say it, some some channeling of wind, some intensification of wind as wind is passing through the city, being channeled by other buildings, you get that intensi intensification of wind, and there was a building in Adelaide which was a very early 
type of curtain wall glazed building. It's the old Jones Lang LaSalle building. It's on Grenfell Street in the city. It's a fairly black building. I'm not sure what's um, who the anchor tenant is of that, that building now. Uh, but when that building was, was first built, I think back in the 1980s, uh, the, the glazing in part got sucked off of that building and you had big glazed panels falling down to the street and smashing, smashing on the ground. Um, so that was, I think that, that happened on a Sunday or, or something, um, but certainly, certainly a fairly, um, fairly scary scenario. Um, and yeah, and often you're you're dealing with with glaze elements that are that are quite high, so so beyond three meters. So you so your storefront glazing um, is typically limited to that, to approximately that that three meters. Um, so from uh, included between between floors, whereas curtain wall glazing can extend past floors. Many custom design features for the yeah. Is this around three meters? Yeah, I think it is actually. Yeah, uh, time one point eight six. How's that? Maybe two or three. Yeah, yeah. Double zero. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So, so we're probably talking about three point six meters in that in that uh, scenario. So we've got yeah, we've got extra tall ceilings here. So it could be classified as uh, criteria. No, no. So that's that's still storefront. So I was just just saying that that um, that it's typically only around that three meters or so. Sometimes you've got these situations where you do have taller taller windows. So it's expressed within the NCC about the size that or the thickness of glass required for its dimensions. So there, there are tables that relate to the dimensions of glass um, and the, the required thickness of those, those dimensions of glass. So as you get quite tall like we've got in this room, that glass has to become much thicker. To, it's like yeah. for standard sizes of window. Yeah. Uh, in Just like the standard sizes of windows. So when you use windows, Glass on windows, mm -hmm. you get standard sizes and dimension. Um, no, no. So, so standard sizes typically relate to the the dimensions that the windows come in when when you're not getting them specifically manufactured for a project. So, standard size doors and windows, when we're talking about a residential sense, have to fit in with the brickwork. So, it's about number of bricks high, number of bricks wide. Um, if so, still with your standard size doors and windows, you can still get fairly large door and window configurations. But um, but because they're typically broken up with other internal frames within those external frames, so internal frames to make them a, a slider, etc., or or part awning, part slider, um, then you've broken your glass glazing elements down into smaller pieces once again, and you can get away with a like, four mil float glass and and in areas where it's right down the ground at five mil toughened glass. Um, whereas when when we've got applications like this where we have much larger glazing elements, we might need to go to six mil glass or or eight eight mil glass for larger larger elements. So so one once you start going to thicker glass obviously and larger larger panes, it's more expense, just just that, that glass in and of itself is, is more expensive, but then um, it's also more expensive to install because it's it's much harder to install and it takes a team of people to to be um, moving these, these glazing elements around as opposed to when you're dealing with much smaller, lighter pieces of, of glass. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, and your, and your curtain wall glazing, so because it's, how I say, it's a feature typically a feature piece within the building, there's, I guess, there's, there's the acceptance of far more expense in that regard. So you do get some very interesting and innovative curtain wall glazing systems designed because people are willing to spend money on those, those elements. Whereas if, if it's something like your, your standard doors and windows for, for a house or store, storefront glazing for 
for a, a, a ground floor uh, retail premise or, or in the TAFE here or so, then because they're, because they're not seen as, a, as an important design feature of those buildings, um, you get less innovation and less uh, detail on those. Um, so storefront, yeah, typically single span, uh, typically less than three metres tall, but can be taller. Uh, it's more economical, so smaller pieces of glass, slim system depth. So we talk about 50 mil thick frames, although the, the frames in here are probably, well, they're, they're that, um, well, the, so the single frames are about 25 mil by 100 mil deep, but then they're, both, they're joined together to make uh, 50 mil mullions and, and 50 mil frames. On, and on that side of the building, they're, they're 50 mil mullions, just a, just a single mullion and about 80 mil deep. Um, so with that, with that storefront system, you, you have the, they're, they're thicker than your standard residential doors and windows. But when it comes to curtain wall glazing, because you've got much stronger uh, strength, uh, much stronger forces acting on that, that glazing, you do need even thicker mullions and, and frames typically. Or you also, um, some systems incorporate glass fins into them. And then those glass fins are really quite deep. Um, and storefront can be, be erected uh, and glaze on site, well, as as can as can curtain wall systems as well. However, typically curtain wall systems, well, I guess actually no, both are the same. Both both have their components manufactured off site and then can be can be erected on site. So storefront components, you've got the the head, the horizontal frame member, which forms the top of the frame. You've got the sill. So that's that's the the member running along the bottom of the frame. You have the jams on both the left and right hand side of the window, and then the mullions, which which make up the the middle section. So run through those again. So um, the head at the top, uh, sill at the bottom, jams at the side, and final one. Mullions in the middle. That's right. You did a drawing in the introduction with a, using a curtain wall. Was it? Oh, okay, right. Okay, so remember introduction. Uh, yeah. Maybe us rebuilding or us mm -hmm. it was using the curtain wall. Yeah. Uh, Cool. Yeah. So you so you're familiar with these elements. Uh, yeah. Just for the curtain wall, I had the idea. Yeah. Yeah. So then, with your with your storefront glazing, it, there there are several different different uh, setups. But typically, you have a have a setup whereby you have you have your frame, and then your glass is inserted into the frame, and then a, then an exterior extrusion is placed on the outside of that to lock that glass. In place, you also have several different forms of um, how to say it, uh, rubber seal as as well here. But this is this is the this is the common system whereby you, where the glass is installed and that plate is is clipped on to hold the glass. Then on top of that pressure plate, then you have have a finishing plate which clips onto that which which makes that pressure uh, which. Uh, Completes the the appearance of that that frame. Um, yeah, actually both both our retaining plates on these on these glaze systems are actually on the outside. So yeah. so these so the, so these mullions. Yeah, yeah. So you can so you can just see that that cover plate on there on the outside. But they don't have much force on them. No, no, it's, no, no, it's a very sheltered area. Yeah. Because it, it's semi enclosed here. It's not fully enclosed, but it's semi enclosed in here. Also, with your with your glazing elements, so you see that these frames are made from extruded aluminium. So they that they have aluminium um, billets which are forced through a die, and you end up having these having some very interesting shapes come out from that. Um, one one of those. So one of the interesting shapes is. You have these screw splines, which head, which run through the frame. So they both provide structure and dimension 
to that, that frame. If you didn't have those screw splines heading through, the, the frames would be, be weaker. So, so they provide some structure, but then they also provide the screwing locations. So, so you can screw this, this section into that one there to assemble the, the, um, the windows. In some, some scenarios where you've got stronger, stronger forces and you want to minimize the size of those, those frames, you have steel elements inserted within those frames. So steel reinforcement, steel channel or tube needed to stabilize the mullion in certain conditions. And then also in uh, in in areas where you where your windows so for external applications where your windows are exposed to whether you have a, a sub seal, which is an outlet for water used at the at the um, seal of a storefront frame. So like like with our um, brickwork and and some other elements of the building, is it is accepted that um, well. I guess the perfect case scenario is, is you don't have any moisture entering the building, but you do need to make accommodation for when seals start getting old, and and if you if you start to have some some leakage with these seals, you want to ensure that 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 water then has a has a tray essentially to go in, and then that tray has little leakage points so it leaks outside of the building. So if you do get any any leakage. This is a secondary protection measure to send that water outside. So, so you have weep holes in the in that um, that base plate uh, to to that lamp enable that that water to to seep out. Various different different forms of curtain wall glazing um, in in terms of the, the the fixings of those curtain wall glazing. So there's there's a structural silicon glazed, whereby you've got a, a backing frame, a backing, um, or a backing structure, and then that structure has, has a mastic or a silicon um, on that frame and the glass is stuck directly to it and then you have, have mastic beads in between those glazed elements keeping them, keeping them all, all watertight. So it's a very simple fixing mechanism and it's it's actually quite a strong fixing mechanism in terms of in terms of suction so that's more of a more of a modern um, approach to, to curtain wall glazing uh, how it's, oh, although there are there are several several approaches this this approach gives that fairly uniform curtain wall glaze so this is a this is a, a structural silicon glazed building here it gives that fairly uniform look to that that glazing while still being able to use smaller glazed elements. So we're not, we're not talking about really large glazed elements. Then there's the, the inside set glazing, which which is where, where you have a framing framing system on the outside of the building and then the glass is put on from the inside. So you so you have your have your framing which is smaller than the, the height between your floor and your ceiling and the, that glass is put on from the inside. So it's it's good in, in terms of the serviceability of that of that glass and and also the installation of that glass becomes much simpler because you don't require any um, uh, any work from outside the building. All that work can be be carried on from from inside the building. And then um, stick built and unitized systems whereby you've you've got um, frames and that glass that sits in the in the frames. It's a little bit like a, a, a cross between your your storefront and curtain wall glazing. Um, so a conventional curtain wall, a stick built system utilising pressure plates, uh, unitised curtain wall, a factory glazed system installed in large units. Um, one of those, uh, so one of those unitised curtain wall systems was also covered in the Chevron lecture as well, which is, which is, uh, what is it? What do they call it? They call it. I think they call it the K wall system, whereby you have large metal plates that these um, glazing elements that well, they have fixing plates located on the glazing elements as well, and they lock into those those large steel plates that are screwed um, or fixed onto the concrete floors. Um, so this is the this is the structural silicon glazed mullions. So mullions. Specifically for butt glazing or, or structural silicon glazing, where that that bead of 
um, that very thick bead of silicon is run on the mullions and then the glazing is stuck to that and then you have, have your silicon or mastic between those glazed units. It allows some flexibility so we don't have, don't have glass directly touching each other because if we did have glass directly touching each other then there's less flexibility and if the building does flex and so on in regards to, to wind and earthquakes and things like that, um, this system with that, that mastic bead in between allows some of that flexibility without forcing glass off the building those, um, in those scenarios. Those silicons and mastic, they, they stick on the aluminium margin? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. As far as as far as I understand. Yeah. So it's yeah. So it's directly to that. Um, what you would what you want to be very sure of is you'd want want to have very clean conditions of those those mullions. So you wouldn't want anything that compromises that yeah that adhesion of this of the silicon to the frame because that because that's your bonding element between your glass and the frame and because you don't have any any framing members that, that clip on the outside to, to retain that glass, that's the only yeah, that's the only thing you have to rely on for that. Um, so structural silicon is used to achieve the appearance of seamless system vertically on the outside. So so this, as I said before, this is a this is a structural silicon glaze, so it's not entirely seamless. You can see the individual glazed units, but it's it it has less interruption than when you have um, framing members and at copper plates located on the outside. So inside glaze system typically used to eliminate working on the exterior side of the building. So you have your have your framing elements and your mullions in place, and then you can put the glass in in there, and then you install these beads to to retain that glass afterwards. So these can be these can once again be um, be taken out. Internally as well, and and fixed and serviced when if if there's any need for that to happen. So water and wind issues. So a quality installation is critical. This includes anchorage and proper sealing of the system. Water will at some point penetrate the exterior of these systems. You know, even you know, all all things all things age, and typically I guess one of your one of one of your trade-offs for when you have flexibility in a in a building product, you tend to tend to lose some long longevity. That uh, just as a as a rule of thumb. So so when you use when you use rubber components in building, they have they have a certain lifespan, and and after a while they, they will start to leak, and seals will become compromised. Yes. My question is like um, when you put the exterior in interior glass, they they create moisture, no? The exterior and exterior. Back on this slide yeah, here. Yeah. So, do they, do they create moisture from the inside of those two glass oh, panels? No. Oh, you're talking about condensation yeah, from yeah, when it's from when it's when it's cold outside. Yeah. Yes, yeah, you will get yes, certainly you will get some some condensation. Um, I guess a way a way of ensuring that you don't have too much condensation is it's about the the uh, management of reticulation of, of air, so your mechanical ventilation within within your buildings, and um, yeah, I guess I guess essentially if you've got good ventilation, then you then you have then you have less humidity within your building, and and less less condensation. Because like in between those panels, do you have to create some form of Oh, oh, okay, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, I, I get you, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so what we can see in this in this slide is we actually have two panes of glass yeah, yeah. operating together. Yeah, what that is, that's actually an insulated glass unit. So, so with with your glazing, another, so that's 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 the modern approach to double glazing. So that um, so that wasn't the intent of this of this to show that that was a double pane, but yeah, but well picked up on. So your old approach to double glazing meant that you you often did get condensation between your two panes of glass. So you had condensation happening in in the middle, and you had these little um, silica gel things to take up that moisture. So you didn't have that visible condensation happening between the two panes of glass. With your modern insulated glass units, they're fully sealed. So 
This little piece that we can see in here is a mastic sealant. And that seals all the way around between those two panes of glass. So you, so, and typically they're filled with argon gas. Argon gas is an inert gas, which helps with um, minimising the transmission of heat from, from one window pane to another. And that sealing and that argon gas means that they, you don't get condensation on the inside of your, of your windows. Yeah. So you get condensation on the inside face, but not in between those two panes of glass. Yeah, thanks for that. That's good. Yeah, well spotted. So, yeah, so here we can see here, once again, we've got, got a frame. We've got the insulated glass units there set into the frame. frame. So, rain screen, the exposed outer skin or surface element of the wall backed by an airspace designed to shield the joints from water. And then you also have have the ability um, well, to have uh, pressure equalisation, so the method of equalising the air pressure within a cavity with the pressure outside the cavity. So, so basically you've got to have these, these weep holes which ensure that this piece, this, that bit of the frame underneath the glass doesn't become, uh, how do I say it, pressurised and, and the air pressure within here, we don't want this air pressure exceeding the air pressure inside the building because if the air pressure inside the building is, is less than the air pressure in here, it, com it can compromise that seal. So, so you have weep holes at the base of that, that portion of the framing. So if you did get any water in here and then you have wind blowing on this, on this glass and providing providing pressure in here, that that pressure can can escape out there, and that water goes goes out those those weep holes. Um, so moisture which collects in the wet area can drain out through the weep holes. The wet area and the area behind the snap cap are all the same pressure. So water control, the equal pressure and rain screen allows gravity to take the water out of the weep holes. If the chamber was not equal, the water would permeate. So the water gets, gets forced inside the building. Uh, so there, uh, equal pressure and rain screen allows gravity to take the water out of the weep holes. Here, this is a scenario if you have a blockage of those, those weep holes and then you get the build up of pressure in here and then that can, can force water inside the building. So uh, two weep holes are required per, per glazing element or per light. The reason for that is just in case one of them gets blocked up, you have that, you have that ability for, for equalisation of pressure and, and water flow. Typically no. So typically they're designed not to be maintained is, is the idea because um, those, you know, well I guess those, those, those weep holes are accessible but yeah, but typically the best design systems are for for curtain wall glazing are systems which are designed not to be maintained because well, yes, if you have just your standard glass, you still need people cleaning the glass, and, and glass cleaning does you know cert <coughs> certainly happens. But typically, if you're going to invest money in in a self cleaning glass, you're also going to want to have have a have a system which doesn't require maintenance that main maintains itself for a very long period and then essentially when these when you got rubber elements that start breaking down etc well then then you will have to have maintenance in terms of replacing those those elements etc but that should be a be a long way down the track so joint plugs used to keep water from running down the vertical glass pocket so so to stop water running down here And then head and mullion caps, or a mullion caps head, head and seal caps. Um, one to to you know to minimise the the water water flowing down, and create a seal to that to that vertical uh, to that mullion. So glass, like any building element, 
um, uh, def can deflect. And so deflection is the amount of inward or outward movement of the assembly when wind pressure is applied. So that, that differs from deflection of a beam. You know, typically deflection of a beam happens downwards. Deflection of a, of a window pane happens inward or outward depending on whether uh, depending on the on the wind forces acting on those those panes of glass. The wind load anchor allows for movement due to expansion or contraction and live load deflection of the floor slabs. So you are going so within within your um, within your buildings and I, I think that was shown in the in the Chevron glazing video as well in regards to the SA water building, they had to design that system to, to allow the, the suspended concrete slabs to deflect. So there was, a, there, was a, there was a concrete slab for the upper floor. During the day when you've got lots of people on it, lots of people working there, that concrete slab deflects downwards. When they all leave, it springs back up again in the, in the evening. And so you have to allow for that, that movement up and down of those, those floor slabs. Um, yeah, so typically we, we don't think of concrete as, as being an element which deflects or, or moves, but, it, but when, you, when you load it with enough people, there is a very small amount of deflection. Not an not a, not a amount of deflection you would feel, but an amount of deflection that still has to be accounted for. So that's the uh, wind load anchor, allows for movement due to expansion and contraction and live load deflection of the floor slab. The dead load anchor, typically used at floor slab design to maintain a rigid connection of the vertical member of the building construction. So, so these 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 steel angles fixed into the fixed into the slab. And yeah, so this uh, so so the the wind load anchor will allow for allow for movement. So we've got got the slotted holes. So you you fix fix in through there, whereas the dead load anchor that's designed for for rigid systems so for systems where where we're not accounting for for deflection of floor slabs and things like that where we have where we'd have a structural element to that floor slab just in behind there and anchoring systems like the F anchor used at the top and bottom of the jams to to anchor those members in place Uh, so yeah, so as I said before, with you with the curtain wall glazing systems, typically because they are just seen as a very important design feature of the building, um, you get you get many different approaches and technologies to them uh, to create that. And so it's you know a flexible system designed to accommodate the vision of the design professional. Curtain wall is designed for use in multi-span applications. Uh, one. One notable example of that is the festival, no, sorry, not the festival theatre, the convention centre on the Torrens. Uh, do, you, do you know the one? The, it's a, what do they call it? The giant pasty, I think they call it. The, the large, the convention centre building, not the new addition, but the older one that has the great big curved curtain wall glazing element to the, facing out to the Torrens there. Um, I've been there for the Comic Con, but... Yeah. On the new building side. Oh, okay. So I'll, I'll bring up a. Uh, so get some images and hopefully I get one from the riverside. Um, that's the bit I'm talking about. But I was hoping to find. Yeah. Okay. We'll just we'll just bring up that that image there. So. With this convention centre, what you what you notice actually oh no that's sorry that's a di that's a different building. I'll have to type in Adelaide Convention yeah. Centre, but that that one's also a giant pasty. Adelaide Convention Centre. Images here we go. Yeah. So. So you see, with with this with this curtain wall glazing on on this on this building here, get that that slightly larger. Um, you see that there's these glazed elements where you've got these. Um, well, we have a we have an absence of mullions happening in there. 
So, so there, there are horizontal uh, support members running through that glass. But what, what's been used in that scenario is we've got cables running from the floor all the way to the ceiling, and then those, those horizontal framing members are supported by those cables, so they're, they're hung in place by the cables. So those, those cables are always in tension, which uh, relieves the, the necessity for, for rigid mullions in that system. So, so we've got incredibly long spans happening with, with that curtain wall glazing, basically from this end to this end, although they, it does come in, they are, those glazed elements are broken into, into different sections. But then um, rather than have, have mullions there, they've actually just got cables holding those, those up. Um, the storefront is also a flexible system but has limitations due to the nature of its design because you've just got those, those frames, etc. So also within here, I encourage you to, to work, have a look and work through these as well. Have a, have a good read through this, this at home. So we won't, won't, um, won't read through that, that here. This is a good resource for at home. Okay. Uh, when we look too far. So now, from from external cladding components. Um, so we've, we've covered. So we covered the external uh, external commercial claddings um, and curtain wall glazing. So for plasterboard lining. So this is not not an important part for for the assessment, but it's important to, to understand with, with construction. Um, so plasterboard or so plasterboard in a commercial context. So uh, typically within a lot of offices you have suspended ceiling systems. So suspended ceiling a uh, type of architectural design element used in commercial and residential buildings created using a metal grid system which is suspended be uh, below the floor um, roof or floor using a series of wires. We don't actually have that in this building. The reason for that is so that you can, as a student, you can look up and you can see the installation of all the services. Um, that that really help, helps us to be able to do that that here. But within a lot of within a lot of office context, you've got these ceiling grid systems. So that ceiling uh, may be flush plasterboard or ceiling tiles, so like these, like acoustic tiles. So this, this one here, what they're constructing there is actually a flush jointed system. So that's whereby you have that grid happening in behind, but then all the plasterboard is fixed to that grid. So, so for this system, we don't have, have the acoustic tiles. We've actually got, we'll end up having a flush plasterboard system that'll look you know, not too dissimilar to this. Both of those systems happen from hangers. And one of the main reasons why it's, it's preferable to have one of these suspended ceiling systems in a commercial premises is so you can run a lot of services behind, like in between that ceiling system and the floor above. That space in between those two is called the plenum. And that's where we're running our air conditioning ducts and plumbing and all this and all these. What's that? Cable trays? Yeah, yeah, etc. Yeah. So, so run all of those. Those hangers could be fixed onto the the floor above or the the roof above by by several different methods. One is onto a steel joist or timber joist or or screwed directly into that concrete uh, with with masonry anchors. Then the hangers extend down from that from that floor above and attach onto those um, those grid elements. Those so the, the channels. Those anchors, you use those guns. Like yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, I imagine. Actually, I've never fixed any any fixing uh, any ceiling ceiling sy ceiling systems. You'd have to you'd have to refer to the installation specs on you know for for a Rondo suspended ceiling system. But I imagine, yeah, to use you'd use shot fired fixings. Yeah. Have Have you seen them being installed? Yeah. Yeah. So. And even for the when you have those uh, cycle. So a bottom plate. From a timber frame, yeah, yeah, on, yeah, yeah, shot fired fixings, yeah, yeah. They need to have a license for that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what What sort of license do you need for using shot fired? It is like um, they consider it guns. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's something I haven't had had too much exposure to. Uh, is that? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so the suspension rods come down from where they're fixed on the ceiling and fix onto the onto the rail. So, so this is our top cross rail, and then that fixes perpendicular to the furring channel for fixing the plasterboard. So, so some systems you have have these rails that. Um, how do I say it? That all that are all included in the one plane. So they'll hang, and then then your acoustic tiles will slot in between these rails. And then in other systems, you have the rails, and then you have the furring channels on the underneath. Yeah. So flush plasterboard ceiling systems. Plasterboard is fixed to the furring channel with with screw fixings. So you've got those furring channels sitting underneath the rails, and then you fix your plasterboard to those furring channels. Uh, flush plasterboard ceilings may also be directly fixed to ceiling joists. When you have, when you're doing this type of system, it gives you less space for running all of those services. So you can, and and some ceiling systems will be a combination of the two. So you have a lower ceiling section, and then you have a bulkhead, where whereby plasterboard is fixed directly to to joists, etc. Like actually in this in this scenario, so we've got lower sections and higher sections bulkheads created. So flush jointed ceiling system joints are taped and set to form a smooth flush jointed continuous ceiling suitable for painting. So the various ceiling systems are available for decorative, acoustic, and fire rated applications. So for many commercial applications, you do require some fire rating. Now that. The fire rating may be, um, how do I say it, that, uh, that might be accommodated by your concrete floor slab or covered by your concrete floor slab. That gives you a very good well, uh, uh, fire rating in excess of what's required by the NCC as long as you have all your penetrations and so on sealed. Or in, in systems where you've got a series of joists and linings, well then those linings will need to be fire rated to create that that fire compartmentalization between the between the two floors. So like so it's uh you have those uh, flush types, they're much better for fire than the ones with the acoustic. Yeah, so yeah, because so, so yeah. you got the metal on it. Yeah, so certainly those acoustic tile systems. Yeah, as far as I know, you can't get an acoustic tile system which is which is going to be fire rated because what it doesn't maintain. Is its structural integrity? Well, actually, no, no. It's so you've got insulation adequacy and, and in integrity. Um, it yeah, it won't it won't maintain its integrity. So um, so yeah, when you yeah when you yeah certainly when, certainly when you've got got heat, you can you can have flames passing through those those acoustic tiles and in the gaps and then yeah and the and that won't won't maintain that that integrity for long enough to to be to be considered a fire separation element. Also, if you were to, uh, yeah, also if you were to just have joists with with a with a sheet flooring on top of those joists, and then have hangers and an acoustic tile underneath, you have very little sound protection between both floors as well. So people walking around on on that on that flooring up above would create a lot of noise down underneath. So. So typically you have you have a um, a ceiling system underneath that <coughs> as well if you're not going to go with that with the flush jointed system. Mm -hmm. So flush jointed systems taped and set. I 
um, to form a smooth flush jointed uh, continuous ceiling. Uh, flush plast plasterboard ceiling systems. So the advantages are smooth, seamless, and easily decorated finish, and also it's I guess essentially it's it's a more a more modern design aesthetic. So so the, the acoustic tiles certainly serve their their purpose. They're called acoustic tiles because they soak up a lot of the the sound, and that that helps a lot with sound attenuation, and that's actually a very important thing. But it's it's possibly a bit of an outdated aesthetic. Uh, suitable to a wide range of roof and floor structures. Uh, surface or flush mounted light fittings can be used. Uh, can <coughs> permit flexible location of internal non load bearing walls. So, um, yeah, because, you don't, because you're not relying on a, on a grid system, you can be placing those internal walls wherever you wish. And fire rated ceilings provide protection for services mounted above the ceiling and can, and can accommodate air conditioning ducts and, and dampers, bulkheads and access panels. And that's, that's another thing. So if, you, if you've got a concrete floor and then you're running all your services under that concrete floor and then a suspended ceiling system under that, if that suspended ceiling system is not a fire rated system, when you get a fire in there, you can get fire into your into your air conditioning ducts, and so so you um, so you need to ensure that there there's accommodation within those air conditioning systems that they're not spreading fire around the rest of the building. So where a level of finish is specified, refer to AS 2589.1 for additional framing and fixing requirements. So AS, uh, actually, do we? Is that? I think that that's covered in here. Yeah. So, so AS twenty twenty five eighty. Oh, so we got got fifty. Uh, sorry, twenty five eighty nine point one. Twenty five eighty nine point one states jointed areas are therefore at best disguised to create the illusion of flatness or uniformity by careful consideration and control of factors such as substrate quality, lighting type, and source, as well as decorated surface gloss levels. The methods for insulation and finishing of these materials as outlined within, within this standard are based on the best practice experience in both New Zealand and Australia towards achieving a sat satisfactory final, final decorated effect. The installation of plasterboard is actually a, a very, um, how do I say it, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly problematic aspect of, of building. It is, is, is an area in which there is there's a lot of a lot of complaints in regards to building. It's, it's one of these it's one of these finishing elements that if there are any defects in it, that those defects stand out really well. When typically with that with timber framing and, and things like that, our, our structural framing, you can there's how to say it, you can have defects and so on in that in that, that timber framing that may not get picked up at at construction phase. But then once they're once they're all covered, if they're not going to cause a problem, then then people people won't com complain about it. If you do have problems with your structural framing, typically those problems are very bad bad problems. But any any of your finishing elements like like your plasterboard, like your architraves, and and yeah, and all those 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 finishing trades, they get yeah they get a lot of attention. And so so there is there is a how to say it, a fair fair deal of a, quite a quite a deal of detail in regards to plasterboard plasterboard installation and and how that how that should be should be done so that detail goes into the thickness of the of the metal so for your studs behind um, I think that's you know uh, you've got certain screws for for one up to 1.6 mil thickness of stud and then for for structural steel beyond that you have different types of screws for um, you have a different type of screw for, for wood fixing than you do for steel fixing, and um, and and there are and each of your um, uh, sorry plast plasterboard or or um, chip rock um, specifies specify within their details or specify within their product literature details of how they should be installed and what the what the correct installation procedures are. Do you have some experience with that? I live in a government housing mm -hmm. in Southbury. Yeah. Um, I can see the my ceiling 
like uh, curb. Oh, sagging. Sagging. Yeah. And the walls are not very straight. So yeah. when you have those uh, trims, how you call those trims? The architraves. Architraves. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. You can see the deep rock like this. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's the one. Yeah. 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 So that's that's that's. Just issues. That's some significant issues. For with the structure, when they have the plaster board. Yeah. I can see from the trims. Mm -hmm. All those uh, spaces. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. And emails. Yeah. And is that a modern construction? Is it? Is that a recent construction, or how old is that? Um. They say the house was built in the um, 80s, 70s, okay. 80s. Yeah. Yeah. Housing. Um, yeah. I live on Spain, Spain Road. So most of the houses there in the 80s. Yeah. 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 So, the, so yeah. what's that? That's the issue. Like yeah. when they put the jeep rocks, it's not like a flat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that would that uh, that makes me think there's probably an issue with the structural framing in behind. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Long day. Um, yeah, my Thursdays are a very long day. So, so starting at six thirty in the morning. Drew. Um, so, anyhow, um, so a really good practice with your structural framing is actually to trench the the bottom plate and top plate. Where trenching means where we use this tool, the trenching tool, which cuts out an accommodation for the stud to sit in, and then the stud is nailed in. That stops that stud from twisting and moving. If you if you don't, like a lot of frames, a lot of structural frames aren't doing that these days. Um, I guess in part because it's really been assisted by nail guns, because you can hold those studs straight and you push push fire a couple of nails in there, and they'll they'll stay straight. Um, but they're not guaranteed to stay straight. And the thing is, if you trench, that's like an extra level of protection to, to ensure they, they stay all straight. If that's not happening and studs start twisting and moving, then you get that that bowing of, of your plasterboard. And so that's that's not so much a plasterboard installation error as it is a structural framing error. And I think that, by the sounds of what's happening in your place, that may be the, <laughs> that may be the case. Um, but also, you've got errors with the installation of plasterboard in regards to if there's if the screw has been driven in too hard. Mm -hmm. If you get that screw driven in too hard, it breaks the paper on the outside of the plasterboard and pushes its way through, and then the plasterboard can pop out because it loses its strength. It loses its fixing strength, and then and then you get deformation yeah. of, of these surfaces as well. And when you when you fix with your screws too close to the edge of the plasterboard, you can easily crack that, that paper as well. So whenever you get the cracking of the paper, then you get um, that plasterboard is no longer fixed properly because yeah. the, the fixing actually happens by sort of pressing the paper in slightly and compressing that, that, that inside plasterboard area. But once you break the paper and break away that, that plaster on the inside, it loses its strength. Yeah. So. Yeah, so it's important as to as to what type of screws are used, the torque on the on the driver for the for the for driving the screws in, um, and and then and then if that's all done correctly and you, and with your plasterboard joints when you when you're fixing them you compress those those joints just ever so slightly so that you can flush over it without without the flushing material sticking out. Does that make? Yeah. 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 You can visualize that. So yeah, so the methods for insulation and finishing these materials out as outlined within this standard are based on the best practice experiences in both both New Zealand and Australia. So so we look to AS twenty twenty five eighty nine for for some of the specifications around that, although your various different product manufacturers have very detailed specifications on that as well. Um, twenty five eighty nine lists levels of finish. So different applications for plasterboard may require different specifications according to where it is to be used and the level of finish required. There are five different levels of finish. So level zero, this level of finish may be useful in temporary construction. So that's just a very, very rough. So, so that's just some plasterboard 
stuck on for um, helping to contain an area. Is the oh. integrity of the plasterboard uh, loose when you put some coating on it and when you had the fire? What's, what's that? When you put some coatings on it and you have the fire happening, so like um, just the integrity of the plasterboard. Oh yeah, so yeah, so structurally for the integrity of that plaster, uh, plasterboard does get damaged by fire very easily. When you have those paints on it. When you have the paints on it. Yeah. What paints? paints? Um, it can still get very easily damaged by fire. Uh -huh. Yeah. Even when it's when it's painted. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So yeah. So one of the one of the things. So um. Oh, well, essentially, oh, I guess yeah. You can't say the plasterboard is non-combustible. If you put plasterboard in the furnace, you can get that that paper or those paper elements to combust. But it's not so. The issue of plasterboard is not so much about its combustibility. But it's it's friability. Once it gets hot, it gets gets very fragile and can break very easily. It becomes brittle. Yeah, exactly. And so so it's that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it won't it won't stand up to much heat at all. And typically, if you got um, if you had a had a fire in in a in a house, you have to be re replacing. Maybe not all the plasterboard linings, but certainly, yeah, certainly some of the plasterboard linings where you've got got that where that fire has happened. Um, in in certain situations, um, where where you've had a fire in a fire in a building and you don't have to be replacing elements, what you still need to do is is paint over that plasterboard with a stain sealer. So, um, yeah, that's that's an, that's often. That's often something that well we, we specify that a lot for the repair and reinstatement of buildings that have been damaged by fire. Where you say if you've got a fire that's just in one room but that, that door is open, that that room you'll typically have to be replacing a lot of elements within that within that room. But then you get smoke going outside of that room and passing through the rest of the building going up near the ceiling. For for this pretty much for the ceiling throughout the whole building, you have to paint on what's called a stain sealer. So you paint on that stain sealer, and then you can paint over top of that. That stops the any of the soot that's deposited on that ceiling from coming back through the paintwork. So those those type of things have to be done yeah, if you've had a had a fire in a building. Yeah. So why why was it you asked about about that? Uh, was it? No, I just had a friend with the soot on the ceiling. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So that's yeah. So that's the thing about. Yeah, so if the plasterboard is not damaged, so if you didn't have sufficient heat to damage the plasterboard and it's still it's still it's not all brittle and, and friable, mm -hmm. yes, then you can paint a stain sealer on there. Usually what brands Michael are the stain sealer? Don't know, don't know. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. But yeah, uh, gee, it's it's a pretty common thing though. Um yeah, stain sealers. So so it's something you can buy from your general hardware store. Right, um, so level zero, that's for just containment of areas. Level one, for use in plenum areas. So I mentioned that word plenum before, about that space between your ceiling and your floor, in areas where the work would generally be concealed or in building service corridors and other areas not normally open to public view. So that's just where you're just using it just to contain, once again, some, some elements where it's not going to be visible. So all joints and interior ankles, Angles should be tape in, um, embedded in joint compound. The surface should be free of excess joint compound. Tool marks and ridges are generally acceptable with access accessories optional that specifies discretion. So, so it's about so you you um, you'll still tape the joints and then flush over that tape, but it's not about it's not about sanding that flushing and then then doing a fine flushing and then sanding that that flushing again. So it's just a very simple flush. So level two, for use in warehouse storage or other similar areas where surface appearance is not a primary concern. All joints and interior angles should have tape embedded in joint compound. One separate coat of joint compound applied over all joints and fastener heads. Yeah, once again, surface should be free of excess joint compound, some minor tool marks, etc. Uh, level three, for use in areas um, which are to receive a heavy or medium Texture, so spray or hand applied finishes where heavy wall covering paper are to be applied. Um, once again, all interior 
angles should have tape embedded in joint compound and one separate coat of joint compound applied over all joints and fastener heads. All compound should be uh, finished smooth, so generally achieved by scraping off nibs and ridges and the like with an edge of a trowel. So, so not requiring a fine sanding and a fine, fine coat. Oops. Sometimes you have these uh, tiles uh, attached on those plaster boards. Right? Yeah, yeah. They're okay with them. Yeah, so um, actually, does, does level three, or does it give that description? Um, receive heavy, medium texture spray or hand finishes? Yeah. Um, I don't know, I'd have to refer to that in Australian standard, but one thing I'd be looking for if you're going to be, so certainly, certainly if tiles are going on there, we're, talk, we're typically talking about wet areas, not always. But if we are doing plasterboard to, to wet areas, do you know what type of plasterboard that needs to be? Well, it's got to be a moisture resistant plasterboard. So, so we've got all these different types of plasterboard. Some are impact resistant plasterboard, some are moisture resistant plasterboard, some are fireproof plasterboards. And you can also get plasterboards which are fireproof and moisture resistant. So, like for different rooms. Yeah, different plaster boards. Yep, exactly. So, so that that moisture resistant plasterboard is used in bathrooms and laundries, any any wet areas. Okay. Now, if we are having to, oh, excuse me, I'm about to sneeze. If we're going to have to use that plasterboard within within a bathroom, we have to waterproof all those joints, and so we want to ensure. That those those joints are going to be going to be quite smooth because what we don't want is any any rough rough bits because with with waterproofing as soon as you get rough bits it gets very difficult to waterproof and and then also that waterproofing can be easily broken and easily compromised so so you'd want fairly flush joints in that in that like system in building, and then tiling over the top like in a building um, like, um, like in uh, how you call that multi-story. Yeah. So you get different plaster boards for different like toilets and offices. You get different plaster boards for that. Uh, yeah, certainly. Yeah. So so in your toilets you use moisture resistant plasterboard. For your hallways you'd use impact resistant plasterboard. Uh, so um, so that's plasterboard with a with a bit of a fiberglass lining in it, uh -huh. and, it and it's stronger. Um, then. For your intertenancy walls, so fire separation walls, you'd use fire, like fire check plasterboard. I've also seen just recently, so there's a there's a product called Shaft Liner, which is also it's a plasterboard liner, but it's 16 mil thick. So our standard plasterboard here, that'd be 10 mil probably. It might be a 13 mil. So for, so for commercial applications, well it actually feels very solid. Yeah, maybe it's going to be 13 mil. Um, but typically inside your house, it's it's 10 mil plasterboard. This shaft line, I've, I've seen that being used recently for, for fire separation walls as well. So I don't know, don't know who's doing, yeah, who's who's specifying that. Um, but yeah, they're, so there there are various. How I say it, to create those fire separation walls, there are various different details and different types of plasterboard you can use for that. Um, so level four uh, finish. What they call yeah. fire check ones. What's that? Fire check. Fire check. Yeah. Fire check, yeah. So fire check is the fire resistant plasterboard, yeah, for doing those intertenancy walls. That was confusing me when I tried to do the uh, some readings. Mm -hmm. So there, there should be different specification for. I was just thinking of what type of plasterboard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, there, yeah. So there are many types of plasterboard. Um, yeah, so a really good resource for this and a really good resource for yourself at home is called the CSR Giprock Red Book. Yeah, make, make note of that, so the, the Red Book. And within that Red Book, it specifies all the different um, different types of plasterboard mm -hmm. and then it gives fixing details and, and, and so on for that. So level four finish, that's generally the accepted level of finish for domestic construction. So for your... Um, so let's say this is our house. This would be our, a level four finish. In fact, I think I think this finish in here is a level four finish. So level four finish is where um, you've got your all your plasterboard joints are flushed, and so they've been been flushed 
flush smoothly and, and sanded. And then your paint is applied directly to that, that the paper on the plasterboard. And so, yeah, so with this, with this plasterboard walling, we shouldn't be able to see any... Well, if we inspect really closely, we may be able to tell where it's been, been sanded and flushed. I can't. Oh, uh, oh no, uh, yeah. Anyhow, so if we were to go over it really closely, we'd be able to find find where it's been where it's been joined and, and sanded and flushed. But but those those joints should should really be quite difficult to find as as they are in this in this construction. And that's that's the level four finish. So where smooth textured finish and satin flat low sheen paints are illuminated by non critical lighting. Level five finish. Um, it's where, where you're going to have a gloss or semi-gloss paints applied. And to achieve that level 5 finish, that's where you, where you paint on a, a, um, a smoothing compound over the whole of the sheet and then that's sanded off really smooth to create a very... Like, so so this, is, this is our lotion paint directly onto the paper. But you can, you can produce a, a, like a like a, a fine flushing surface on top of that paper and then sand that really smooth and then you can apply a gloss paint to that to give a really smooth finish. So that's for that's for your that's for your high end construction or or where you've got um, how do I say it? Um, yeah, critical lighting happening on, on walls. So where you've got wall uh, lights lights going directly onto walls. Here we are, back here. So, um, AS2589.1 covers fire, resi fire resisting systems. So, where fire resisting construction is specified, the details of the manufacture of the relevant, syst relevant tested system shall be adhered to. So, you're just downloading the red book there. That red book, you'll, you'll notice that's a, that's a massive document. I don't, did you notice that already? So, it's like 500 pages or so. It's, it's big. Um, there are a host of details in there in regards to the construction of fire separation walls. And that's, and that's what, this, that's what this, this is talking about. So when installing fire rated systems, attention should be paid to the following. All systems comprising more than one layer joints in successive layers should be staggered. And you'll see that within the, within the red book. They've got, got details there showing, showing where a sheet goes on and then where the sheet goes on on top. You don't line those joints up but you actually stagger those joints by 1,200 millimetres or so. So, so you, you space them directly, like stagger them directly half. Um, sheets should be cut accurately and neatly so as to minimise gaps between sheets and the abutting floors or ceilings. So all, all, of, your, all of your cuts, um, what, what, should, what should happen in construction is that all of your framing members behind should be at 600 centres. And those framing members should be set out so that they accommodate the fixing of plasterboard without having to cut any sheets. That's the most important, important thing. If you get those walls where, um, yeah, where you don't have any cutting of sheets happening, well, well, what you should be doing with those studs essentially is they should all be at 600 centres except for if if you if you have have a uh, Actually, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit difficult to explain because it all starts with the roof framing and all your, all your um, hips and so on, well, they'll, they'll all run to, run to corners. But then from the junction of your hip and your ridge, you have a jack rafter heading down from that. From that point there, you might have a small gap, but then from there on, they're all at 600 centres, which means your studs should be directly underneath those rafters, which means they'll all be at 600 centres. So... Throughout that whole wall, you'll only have one little piece that's that's less than 600 centres. That's where you're going to have to be cutting your plasterboard sheets. So the framers should do their job to ensure that, that the cutting of those plasterboard sheets um, only happens once within that wall. And then same goes for your ceilings, that all your joists should be at 600 centres so those plasterboard sheets go on really quickly and easily and then there's just one little section there where they need to be, um, where they need to be cut. 
Um, so, so it says here sheets should be cut accurately and neatly so to minimise gaps between sheets and batting floors, but that framing should be set out to ensure that there's no cuts that need to happen anyhow, is basically the moral of the story. Penetrations in systems are allowed only if ins installed in, in accordance with the tested system. Only paper joint reinforcing tape should be used in joints. So the correct joint reinforcing tape. Mechanical fixing should be the only fastening system used. Um, oh yeah, uh, for fire added, yeah, okay, yeah, for fire resisting systems, okay. So typically for your, for your, your walling systems, you, you can use a combination of mechanical fixings and um, glue fixings. So you add these large dobs of adhesive to your studs and then all the edges of the plasterboard are, are fixed with the um, mechanical fixing, so your screws. So all the edges are fixed with screws, all the internals are fixed with adhesive. With a fire rated system, it has to be fixings all the way, mechanical fixings all the way through. You also have acoustic rated systems. So fire is not the only thing that we need to separate between sole occupancy units. We also need to, to separate out for noise. We don't want noise carrying, carrying through. So building regulations allow the use of gypsum plasterboard in multi-residential and residential construction to achieve specified levels of sound reduction. Where sound rated construction is required, the details of the design of the relevant system should be adhered to. So once again, if you're going to be using, like, say, CSR Gyprock, refer to the Red Book all the details within, within the Red Book. That's both for, both for designers and installers. When installing sound rated systems, attention should be paid to the following. The acoustic performance of the finished wall system may be compared by reducing the results of airborne sound transmission losses uh, derived in AS 1191 into a single representative number called a sound transmission class. So it's about measuring the amount of sound that can go, go through and you determine that sound trans transmission class. Uh, site conditions are usually less than ideal and less meticulous care goes into sealing the perimeter and penetrations of the laboratory. Uh, sound transmission class values may not be achieved. So that's just so that's just basically saying that you know that in the real world um, you do get sound bleeding between <laughs> yeah between sole occupancy units or between lecturing rooms or, or so. Um, other elements of building can can seriously affect the acoustic performance, particularly flanking paths of sound. So the acoustic performance of other elements of the building, such as doors, windows, ceiling joints, and roof space, needs special consideration when designing to achieve a given sound reduction level. One really important thing to think about when you, if you're thinking about the con containment of sound, if you have any air gaps, sound travels through those air gaps well. So you can have a, a, a meticulously designed acoustic walling system that separates all elements so you don't get that the transmission of vibration through a wall and, and, and things like that. But if you have some tiny little holes at the top of the wall, sound gets through those, those holes. And sound, soundproofing should be thought of like waterproofing, like as if you're making the, that whole building watertight. So if water can seep out of that building, so can sound. And so that's, that's, a, that's a way to, to think about approaching, approaching that sound. So key points to consider. Uh, fire mastic must be used in fire rated systems where corking is indicated and is also recommended for corking acoustic systems. Recessed lights must be installed so as to prevent damage from temperature rise and prevent the risk of fire. Plasterboard must be stacked flat, properly supported on a level platform or on support members which extend the full width of the sheets and which are spaced at a maximum of 600 millimeter centers. So, so stacked on supports, 600 millimeter centers, that's exactly the same spacing that you'd have for plasterboard fixings in a wall. Framing. Timber framing. Timber members uh, to which plasterboard will be fixed must comply with AS 1684 residential timber frame construction or AS 1720.1 timber structures design methods. So AS 1684 is the standard uh, Australian standard used for designing timber frames 
for your, for your conventional timber frame. So, so this, you know, that, this model roof that we have here, that would be designed in accordance with AS 1684. If we want to step outside the bounds of the capabilities of AS 1684 for designing, so there's certain limitations like we can't have a wall higher than three metres or 3.6 metres if it's a skillion, and, and the, all these all these limitations. Not a, we can't have a roof steeper than 35 degrees pitch. 35 is, is the maximum steepness of pitch. If we want to step outside those those parameters that AS 1684 has, you can still design timber timber framed buildings, but they have to be designed in accordance with AS 1720. So that's where we get our two timber framing codes from. So, um, but plasterboard has to be has to be mounted to a system that that complies with either one of those. Be spaced at no more than 600 uh, centres. So our so our framing members, our studs have to be at 600 centres, as do our ceiling joists. Have a mi minimum fixing face width of 35 millimetres. So you so that means we can't can't use uh, framing elements that are thinner than 35 millimetres, and have a timber moisture content at the time of lining of no more than 16%. So 16%, well I think 13% is your typical seasoned timber, so it's allowed to have a little bit more moisture than, than, than typical seasoned timber, but you're not, so the, the thing from that is, you're not allowed to have moist timber that you're fixing the plasterboard to. I, I think it's a bit of a, of a no brainer. But steel framing, the steel framing to which a plasterboard will be fixed must comply with AS Australian Standard, New Zealand Standard 4600, cold formed steel structures. Be spaced at no more than 600 centres. Have a minimum fixing face width of 32 millimetres. So 35 millimetres for timber, 32 millimetres for steel. Be no greater than 1.2 millimetre base metal thickness. I now I think within that Australian standard, you can actually fix plasterboard to steel with a with a with a greater than 1.2 millimetre base metal thickness, but you have to use different fasteners. But as a rule of thumb, the your cold formed steel steel framing, 1.2 millimeter maximum thickness. So uh, ceiling tiles, so that's what we, we spoke about, about earlier, those those ceiling grid systems. So the grid systems provide easy access for maintenance come in a variety of styles and are primar primarily made from mineral fiber blends to give them that rigidity so they can they can hang between these these hanging members uh, without without sagging can you walk on a suspended ceiling i wouldn't want to but there are certain um, yeah or well here it's all, it's all explained here so ceiling systems should be designed to AS 2785, suspended ceiling design and installation. Most ceilings are not trafficable unless stated and are designed to carry the weight of the ceiling only. Where a trafficable ceiling is required, insta um, installation, a proprietary trafficable ceiling system such as Rondo Walkabout is necessary. So, so there are, yeah, so there are, yeah. So that when the Rondo yeah. steps. Uh, it's the task too. So yeah, we, we have those walkabouts too. Right. Yeah. So there's yeah. So so the suspended ceiling system yeah. that you can walk on. Yeah. So you've what you've you've written about that in task two. Uh. For I know I I, I let me. Yeah, uh, you just discovered it. Yeah. Yeah. It's so because you have the website on the task two. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, going through the red book there, you'll you'll see um, how to say it, reference to to Rondo systems as well within that within that red book. It's owned by the same company. Yeah. Not that I'm not that I'm pushing products <laughs> on you or anything like that. No. It's it's just I'm um, just pointing you in the direction of of what what manufacturers have have really good information there, good accessible information. So control joints are to be installed in both fire rated and non-fire rated ceilings. 
to coincide with control joints in the supporting frame. Where, so where you have a control joint in a building, control joints have to be carried through from the bottom of a building. If you've got a control joint in a, in a concrete slab, that means that where you have the control joint in that concrete slab, you have to have a control joint in the wall. Where you have a control joint in a wall means you have to have a control joint in the ceiling. Where that stops, though, is, is um, if you've got a control joint in the wall, in the floor, wall, and ceiling, you don't necessarily have to have it on the roof. And, uh, and that's certainly, certainly that makes, makes sense. Roofing, roofing structures are typically more flexible, and essentially what you don't want to have is have a joint in a roof that opens up, opens and closes. So, so you can have, so with the lapping of sheets, you can have a little bit of movement like this without any deleterious effects. But with, with a, if you've got movement of, a, of two floor slabs doing this, then you have to accommodate for that movement in the wall. And if you've accommodated for that movement in the wall, you have to accommodate for that movement in the ceiling. So you have to have a control joint in there. Now, we don't have any ceilings in this building, so I can't show you any control joints. Not that, not that I think, I don't think we have any, any act, uh, I don't know. If, if we've got control joints in this, in this floor slab, they're, they're very well hidden. Um, so, uh, in continuous interior ceiling areas, space at no more than 12 metres in both directions. So if you've got a continuous ceiling system, then every 12 metres you need to have a control joint. That's to allow expansion and contraction and some flexibility of the buildings. Buildings, buildings do move. Buildings do do flex. And and the best and the best thing is is when you've got a building. Well, okay. I guess the best thing is when you have a building that doesn't flex, right? But the best thing is if you've got a building that that flexes, that that any of that flexure in the building is accommodated for by those control joints and that and it becomes it's, it's not obvious so the people living in that building they don't even notice that the building has done a little bit of moving that and that's and that's the i guess essentially that's the purpose of control joints so control joints may be positioned to intersect light fixtures heating vents and air diffusers so that's in the that's in the ceiling so if we were to you know think about our, our grid grid system if we have a control joint in a well, actually, I guess a uh, grid system is all control joints, so that's a bad, bad analogy. But if we were to have a flush jointed system that's more than 12 metres, if we had a, a lighting bay going across, you know, from one side to the other, or, or a series of lighting bays, that would be the place to put that control joint. So most of that control joint is actually hidden. So control joints in exterior ceilings placed at no more than uh, 6 metre centres in both directions and it changes of framing type. So various different details by the product manufacturers around how to construct control joints. Um, so that's yeah, control joint for non-fire rated ceiling and then oh, that's once again control joint for non-fire rated ceiling. So you have to have a look in the red book for control joints of fire rated systems for, for getting some of those, those details. Oh, there we go. Um, oh, that's okay. Oh, that's, that's a different one. So, search for a copy of the Giprock Ceiling Systems Installation Guide. Read through the framing section. Have an understanding of the design considerations and detailing requirements to achieve certain FRLs, and make allowances for mechanical and electrical penetrations. Download your own copy of the Giprock Red Book. This book contains all fire rating scenarios you could be faced with and how to achieve FRLs using various systems. To fully understand this book once, down, once downloaded, go to the chapter how to use this book and then on page A17 fire testing and familiarize yourself with all the important, with all the information on this page. So that's, that's about achieving those, those fire rating levels, or fire resistance levels, sorry. Right. So we'll stop, stop that there. I think...